This is CLS All One, and today I'm going to be replacing the roof on this motorhome. This is a 1995 Flare Fleetwood, and the roof on this is in really bad shape. I do a lot of residential construction, and the roofs on these RVs and motorhomes is quite a bit different. So here's a look at the existing roof. As you can see, there's numerous tears in there. It's got exposed plywood. I'm going to have to patch some of the plywood in. And I just got tears all over this thing. This thing should have been replaced a long time ago. This roof is so bad that the original color used to be white. And you can't even tell because the whole thing's black now. Most of your motorhome roofs come in two layers that are bonded together. The bottom layer is black and then the top layer is white for a nice reflective coating. So the white layer in this roof has completely eroded away. For the roofing material, there's multiple products out there to choose from. But some of the most popular ones are the EPDM, which is just a straight rubber roof. That'd be the most popular one. Another one would be the TPO roof, which stands for thermoplastic olefin, and that's the material I'm going to use for my roof. And here's a quick look at the TPO roof after it's installed. It has very similar properties to the EPDM. It even installs the same and uses the same glue, but it costs less. One of the main differences between the two products is it's not quite as flexible as the EPDM. But for me, I had no issues with that, and it worked just fine for my motorhome. So to start off here, we're going to go ahead and remove all vent hoods, covers, and housings. Most screw covers are pretty straightforward in how to remove. They either have a Phillips screw or a quarter inch head screw. This motorhome has both. For your ventilation covers that open and close, normally you can just leave those on and just remove the base and take it all off at once. To remove the base, you're going to have to scrape off the old lap sealant. A putty knife works really well for this project. Once you have the lap sealant removed, you'll have access to the screw heads. After removing all the screws, the base should pry up fairly easy. If you're going to be reusing the base, take your time and be careful not to crack or break the base. And also, if you're reusing that base like I am, you want to make sure to clean off all that old sealant or you won't get a good seal. After removing all your covers and bases, it's time to remove all your termination bars, end strips, and caps. This is your front termination bar located on the front of the motorhome. You want to go ahead and remove that lap sealant so it gives you access to the screw heads and then go ahead and remove all those screws. Not all motorhomes are the same. Some of your termination bars look different and sometimes you have a cap instead of a termination bar. But they all serve the same purpose. It makes a nice seal joint wherever your roofing material ends. So I'm using a utility knife to score line where the old lap sealant is so I can pry this termination bar up easier. So I got my front termination bars off right now. Now I just got to clean off the old sealant and putty. Now here's a look at the back of the motorhome. On the back it's a cap instead of a termination bar. So this is a cap that wraps around the top and the side of the motorhome. So same thing here, we got to clean off that lap sealant so we have access to the screws. Then on the back side of the motorhome, I have rivets that I'm going to have to drill out. Most of the time it's going to be screws here, but on this one unfortunately I have rivets that have to be drilled out. Once the rivets are removed, the cap should pull off fairly easy. Whoops, that came off way easier than I thought. Luckily my spare tire caught it. Now it's time to remove the side termination bars or drip edges and these are also are riveted in place. So I'm going to have to drill each one of these holes. But I did find out that if you have a sharp chisel and a hammer, you can knock off the front of the rivets here and make the job go a lot faster. For the remaining part of the rivet that's left sticking out of the hole, you can just use a hammer to hit it flush. Now it's time to remove the old roof. Because the condition of this roof is so bad, it's just ripping off in small little pieces. So this old rubber roof is just glued down to plywood. So what I found works best is just a putty knife to get underneath an edge and start it, and then rip off as big as piece as I can. Which unfortunately for me, these are not very big pieces. If you have a pickup truck and you have the room for it, it'd be a good idea to park right next to it so you can throw that old roofing material in the back of the truck. Especially if your roof is coming off in a thousand pieces like mine. So because my roof was in such bad shape, 
I gotta replace some of the plywood. So I'm gonna replace a full piece right there. Then I'm gonna replace a partial sheet here in the back corner. And then another full piece right here. So for the majority of the RVs and motorhomes that have a rubber roof, it usually consists of a layer of plywood on the top, it's about a quarter inch thick, followed by a layer of rigid styrofoam that's usually about an inch and a half thick, which also includes either wood framing or steel tube framing for structure, which steel framing is what I have on mine. Then on the bottom we have another quarter inch sheet of plywood, and with all these materials combined, it gives you good lightweight structure that's pretty strong. So to remove the old wood, it's no easy task. It's all glued straight down to the styrofoam so it comes up in small pieces. I tried using a pry bar at first to remove some of the wood, but I ended up damaging some of the styrofoam because every time I'd rip off a chunk with the pry bar, it'd tear off some of the styrofoam. But when using a putty knife, I could stay in between the wood and styrofoam and not damage it. Okay, I got all my wood removed that I'm going to be replacing, and now I need to clean the surface really well so I can get good adhesion to that styrofoam. And I found that if you use a wire brush on the top of the styrofoam, that preps the surface pretty well. But when using a wire brush, be careful not to take off too much of the surface. For the plywood, I'm actually using a quarter inch underlayment that's moisture resistant that I purchased from Home Depot. So I'm going to go ahead and dry fit this piece first, and I'm going to do that by pre-drilling some holes and using a countersink bit to make sure those screw heads get flush. So the seams on this piece of plywood line up with the steel tubing underneath and I'm going to drill a hole every 5 inches to secure the panel. For screws, I'm going to be using a wood to metal self tapping screw. And for now I'm just going to put a screw in each corner, that way I can line out my panel much easier after applying the adhesive. And for my adhesive, I get to try a new toy here. I just purchased a professional foam gun made by Great Stuff, along with a can of wall and floor adhesive made by Great Stuff that works great for gluing wood to foam. And if you use spray foam very much, I definitely recommend you pick up one of these guns. This thing is way better than just buying a can with that straw on top of it. Those things are so messy. With this one, when you get done spraying, there's no excess foam dripping out of the tip. So it makes it a much cleaner job. So now I'm going to go ahead and remove the four screws so I can apply the adhesive. For the adhesive, I laid a bead that's about half inch wide every inch and a half. This stuff does expand but it doesn't expand near as much as the Great Stuff Gap Filler. So here's a quick look at how much adhesive I applied. You don't want to be cheap with this stuff because you want some good adhesion with that piece of wood. So now we want to quickly get that wood in place. And this stuff does set pretty quick. The adhesion is really good with this stuff. In fact, the adhesion is so good that it was stuck to my fingernails for almost a week. So you probably better wear gloves if you don't want that to happen to you. So I got my piece of wood secured with countersunk screws every 5 inches around the entire perimeter. And it's secured to that steel tubing. Here's a look at the steel tube here. This runs from front to back. Then there's also a steel tube that runs on the back here. And then down the whole length of the side here. And then one that goes across right here. So I got this piece secured nice and tight. Now I'm going to use the skim comb patch compound to make the joints nice and smooth so there's no abrupt edges. I will also use the patching compound to fill any imperfections, like any of the screw head holes. Now it's time to install the next piece of plywood. I'm going to go ahead and dry fit it like the last one and make sure to pre-drill all the holes. Now I'm going to remove the piece of wood and apply my adhesive. Then quickly lay the wood into place before the adhesive sets. Now I'm going to install all my screws here. And I'm trying to put a screw every 5 inches anywhere there's any framing underneath. So on this particular piece, on one side here there's no framing right in this area right here. If you have a joint like this, it may be necessary to weight it down with some sort of weight. In my case, the adhesive seems to be holding the joint down just fine, but I'll keep a close eye on it. Now I'm going to go ahead and clean the entire roof and prep it so I can apply seam tape. 
A lot of the old wood is stained black from the previous rubber roof, but that won't affect adhesion. It's just cosmetic. Now it's time to install the seam tape. This is a really thin tape that's meant to use for all your seams, and it can also be used to seam two pieces of roofing material together. Per manufacturer, it says you don't have to do anything with the joints unless there's a gap more than an eighth of an inch. But I'm going to go ahead and put it on all my seams just to rule out any future issues. The seam tape comes in various different widths. This width here is about six inches. For some of the seams, I ended up cutting the roll in half so I could get double the length. And I used so much seam tape that I had to use a different brand to finish the job, but it has similar properties. So as you can see here, I have seam tape on all my joints here to help give it some extra protection. And now we're ready to install our new roof. So I'm going to start at one end of the motorhome here. It doesn't matter if it's front or back. I'm at the front here, and I'm going to do about four feet at a time. I found that if you try to do half the motorhome, uh, your glue might dry on you too fast and you end up with a big mess. So I'm just going to do four feet at a time here. Here's the adhesive I'm going to be using. This came with a kit which included the TPO roofing and some lap sealant. And I'll make sure to post a link down below where I purchased it. So this adhesive works for both EPDM roofs and TPO roofs. You can apply it with an eighth inch V-notch trowel or you can just roll it on. And in my opinion, that's way easier. So right where the roofing is sitting right now, I'm going to skip that first foot and a half and not put any adhesive there because I'm going to have to come back and tuck in that edge later, so I'm going to do the rest of the roof first. After applying the adhesive, you want to let it set up till it gets a little bit tacky. In my situation, it's 100 degrees a day, so this stuff's getting tacky pretty fast. So now I'm going to roll out about 4 feet of roofing and start pushing all the air bubbles out. You can either use a stiff broom or you can use what I'm using. I use this a lot for vinyl flooring. This is just a window mop that has a rigid plastic piece inside and it allows me to push all those air bubbles out pretty easy with this. Some of the creases and air bubbles might take some time to get rid of them. The roofing material might have to sit in the sun for a while so it can relax. That way you can push those creases and air bubbles out much easier. And be careful as you're covering any of those holes. I made sure to mark them with a marker, that way I didn't step in that hole and damage the roof or hurt myself. And you want to try to make sure that you install this with at least being 75 degrees or hotter. Uh, that way the roof is more pliable. If you do it in colder weather, that roof ain't going to be very pliable and you're just going to have a hard time. So here's a look at what I've done so far. I've done a little over half the roof, but I still got some air bubbles I'm going to have to work on here. And as the roof relaxes in the heat, I'll keep working on those. So I'm just working my way to the end there, uh, taking my time as much as I can anyway without the glue drying. Now I'm going to go ahead and cut off that excess slack here at the end. I don't need any of this. I'm just going to go ahead and chop it off flush with the back here. And I'm just using a utility knife, nothing special. Now I'm going to work on the air bubble some more here. Now I'm going to head to the front where I very first started and apply some adhesive there and then get that edge tucked under. So I'm going to go ahead and roll it back here and roll on the adhesive. And with the adhesive, you don't want to be cheap with it. Make sure to roll on at least two coats of it. Now I'm going to tuck my roofing underneath the front fiberglass here. And then push all my air bubbles out. Now it's time to start cutting all my holes for my vents and covers. And there's a couple different ways you can do this. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drill a hole in each corner, at the very corner, about a quarter inch hole. Then I'm going to mark it with a marker and then cut it with a utility knife all the way to each hole that I drilled. Another way to do it is to cut the X first with the utility knife, then at the end of your cuts use a hole puncher. And what the hole does at the end of your cuts is it protects the material from ripping past that point. Now I'm going to use some screws to secure it to the side of the opening. If you have wood framing, you can just use staples to secure it. These are self-tapping screws so it can go through that metal, but it has a pan head so they're nice and flush. After securing all the edges, just go ahead and cut off the excess material with your utility knife. Now I'm going to install my side termination bars. 
I've drawn a line here with a marker that indicates where my center line is so I know right where to put my bar. I've also slightly changed the location of the termination bar. That way I can just use reference screws to secure it, not rivets. Here's a look at the termination bar. It came in two different pieces, one shorter and one longer piece. And I'm gonna use some butyl tape and apply that to the back of the termination bar here. So it makes a nice gasket where it secures against the side. Before installing the new butyl tape, make sure to remove all the old gasket material or you won't get a good seal. Now it's time to install a bar, but because the side of my motorhome is made of fiberglass, I'm gonna have to pre-drill the holes first. After drilling my hole, I'm gonna secure the bar with a roofing screw. This is an inch and a half long screw, and it's got a metal washer and rubber gasket on top. When you tighten it all the way down, it gives you a waterproof seal. So on the termination bar here, there's a hole about every six inches. So I got a lot of drilling ahead of me here. So I got the short termination bar installed. Now it's time to install this longer one. This bar by itself is about 24 feet long. So it's gonna take another person to help me hold this up. After you get your bar secured, it's time to go ahead and cut off the excess roofing. I'm just gonna use my utility knife here and cut right at the bottom of my termination bar. Now it's time to install the end cap on the back of my motorhome. I run a lot of butyl tape, so I'm gonna use some putty tape. It's not near as sticky as the butyl tape, but it still works plenty good for a gasket. And for the end cap, I'm also gonna be using the inch and a half roofing screws. And I'm gonna to have to pre-drill each hole because I have metal tubing that's located underneath. And even if you have wood framing, it's probably a good idea to go ahead and pre-drill those holes first. That way you don't split or crack any of your wood. Now it's time to apply some lap sealant. This is a self-leveling white lap sealant made by Decor. So it says self-leveling, but you still wanna put your bead on as nice as possible, or it's gonna look pretty crappy. So what we wanna do is seal right where the end cap meets your roofing material. Right at that edge, you wanna go ahead and apply a bead of lap sealant. Make sure not to leave any exposed areas between the end cap and the roofing material. If there is any exposed areas, just go back over it with another bead. Here's a closer look at the bead after I was done laying it. And if you don't have waterproof screws like this, you need to go ahead and seal those off also. And I'll give you an example here. So if this was just a regular screw with no gasket, you wanna go ahead and seal the top of it with your lap sealant. So make sure none of the screw is exposed and covered completely with lap sealant. Now it's time to install the front termination bar. And that's gonna go here, it actually is in two pieces. So we're going to install this side first, and I'm going to use putty tape for this also to make a gasket. And I'm going to install the putty tape too wide, that way it makes me a gasket on both the top and bottom edge. And again, I'm going to be using those same reference screws to secure this termination bar. After securing it, I got a little bit of the gasket squeezing out on the top and bottom, and that's what we want. Now it's time to go ahead and apply the lap sealant. So we want to seal both the bottom and top edge, and we're also going to seal this joint once we butt the two pieces together. We also want to apply a bead of lap sealant on the top of the side termination bars. So here's how your lap sealant should look when you're all done. So I've got a bead of lap sealant on the top of my termination bars here, going down the whole side of the motorhome here. Now it's time to start installing all my vent housings and covers. So I'm going to start off by putting a layer of putty tape on the bottom for my gasket. And as you can see here, I'm reusing my vent housings. Uh, these were just clamped on before. They didn't have any screws that secured through the top. So I'm actually going to use some screws this time to secure them. So I'm going to go ahead and pre-drill all my holes and then use roofing screws to secure them. Then go ahead and seal all the edges with lap sealant. 
then slide my covers on and attach the hardware. There's various different covers out there, so yours may secure with screws, but they're all pretty straightforward in how to put on. Okay, here's a look at it. I'm just about done. Uh, the only thing I have left to do now is install some vent hoods, and I'm going to go ahead and release a separate video on how to install those. And I'm very happy with how this roof turned out, and when winter hits, I'm probably going to buy a cover just to protect this roof and make it last as long as possible. And here's a quick look at the vent hoods, just to show what it looks like after I install those. Well, thanks for watching. This is CLS All in One. If you want to hear more from me, please like and subscribe. And if you want to check out more of my videos, just click any of these links.